Greeting friends, welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. We begin today a new study and a new book, and that is 1 Corinthians. The next in the series which we're doing here in the New Testament books, 1 Corinthians, of course, is written by Paul to the church at Corinth. And according to historians, 1 Corinthians written approximately around 59 A.D., and at the end of Paul's uh, three-year residence at Ephesus. Paul, having been there and more than once in his travels to Corinth, and there, like many other places where he traveled to, establishing churches of those that were saved by the grace of God, in all the regions, and Paul going out desiring that he might even reach beyond to where the gospel had not been preached, those in his day and time might know of his Lord and his Savior, Jesus the Christ, and certainly we too should strive for these things in the days which we live. But say, well, Pop, the Christ is so well known. Surely there's no one that no, has not heard the gospel. Surely there's no one that does not know. But they are. They're all around about us. It's so commonplace, I believe, in the days which we live. People just sort of accept that it's there. They uh, basically overlook it. They just don't dwell upon it. But all around people are Christians and believers, and most of them are living their lives day by day and not really vo uh, verbally, vocally declaring their faith to those around about them, and perhaps at times not even thinking about the fact that there is someone in their midst that does not know the Lord, maybe has never heard the gospel preached, something really we ought to declare it. And here is Paul and his desire for those that had heard the gospel as he writes to Corinth. The church of Corinth having many issues, many troubles, being Gentiles, and having some of the troubles and the sins and the problems of Gentiles in those days. Paul writes to them in this first of two letters. And we begin to read here and it says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. He identifies himself and those this other dear brother is with him at this time. Certainly they would have received, and churches were receiving the letters in those days and times, and some of the letters they were receiving were not uh, for, truly from Paul or from any of the other apostles. But as the scripture speaks of churches in those early days having to try some that claimed they were apostles, and they were not. But Paul was. He was called of the Lord Jesus Christ to be an apostle. But even in this day and time, there are still those that want to say, no, Paul wasn't truly apostle. He was a servant of Satan. Uh, there are some who call him the Antichrist. And I say to you that those are bitter people and, and people that don't want to accept the whole counsel of God. They don't want to accept the fact that God has given us responsibilities as men and women to live godly in this present life and to live not according to our wants and our desires, but according to the word of God that we ought to live by. And Paul did strive to do that both before and after he was saved. Before he was saved as a Jew and a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he was trying to serve God as best he knew how as a lost, undone, religious man. And many are in that condition. They are religious people, but they are still just as lost as any other person who is not a religious person. But Paul declares that it is him, that Paul, who was called to be an apostle, writing this, he was called by Jesus Christ and by the will of God. It is by the will of God that he and the other apostles were chosen to be in the positions that they were in. And the truth be, my friends, that all of us are chosen of God. Chosen of God unto salvation. And these things Paul declares in through his letters. That we should trust in our Lord, the only uh, Lord of our salvation, His only begotten Son, the only begotten Son of God the Father. And that it is God the Father's will that His Son came and died and suffered there on the cross of Calvary. And that he did indeed arise after three days and three nights from the grave, giving us the hope of resurrection. And that that Holy Spirit is the one who has shown us Jesus, that we might know and believe upon him. But he and his uh, other brother in the faith here, 
and all others that have been true believers being called by the will of God and according to the will of Jesus Christ also and the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, the Trinity, working together in this great salvation which we have been made a part of. And Paul, as he begins to declare in verse 2, he says, Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. The church of God, that local visible assembly, that body in Christ that is there. A local visible body of Christ. Not a universal invisible body that can't be seen, but a visible body of believers that that community could see that came together that they were followers of Jesus Christ. That they were desiring to follow Him and to be, uh, live godly lives and show forth Christ's likeness to those round about them. A meekness and a spirit and a desire that people might see God the Father. That's who Jesus was doing or presenting. Pointing people to God the Father that they might know Him because He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There is a trinity. And my friends, we need to see it. We need to believe upon it. But we most importantly, we need to believe upon Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of glory. He goes on to say here, as he speaks here to the church of Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. We are all sanctified, my friends. That means we've been set apart. Set apart unto his service, unto the calling that he has called us with. Unto his, and it is his will that we be set apart like this. Set apart from that old sinful walk of life wherein we live for ourselves. Live according to the pleasures of this world and the flesh. And if we've been set apart unto that, unto service, unto God, if we would live godly lives and be a holy people in this present life, that we might show forth Jesus Christ in our walk of life. And that we do not always do that. Even as Paul speaks of himself, that he did not always do what he ought to do. And the things that he uh, should not do, sometimes he did. Friends, we are going to always be sinners in this present life. Either a lost sinner or you're a saved sinner. And we need to realize this, that we're all sinners. And we all have need of salvation. And salvation is only in through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. But once we are saved and God begins to show us and teach us things, that He shows us this, that He is the one who has sanctified us. He is the one who has set us apart unto His service, that we might bring glory and honor unto Him, that we live godly lives, and that we'd follow Him, look to Him, and looking to Him, we're looking to the Father. And it is our Holy Spirit that gives us understanding, helps us to discern the truth of God's Word. He goes on to say, called to be saints. And that's not in the future tense. That's, and I, by that I mean I don't mean it's after death, but it's in this present walk of life. We've been called out of darkness unto His marvelous light. He sanctified and set us apart that we should be saints, the saints of God. And that, again, means that we've been set apart, that we've been chosen to be His people, and that we are His saints, we are His chosen people, and that we ought to live a life that shows forth godliness. You can't do that if you don't turn from your sins and repent from them and... Strive to understand and live by the Word of God. We ought to love Him even as He's loved us. And He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Keep those things which God has shown you. And pray God give you the grace and the strength to be more faithful unto those things. For I know, I know that in our thoughts there are desires and uh, I, I, thoughts going through our head at times that are against God and against righteousness. But God has given us something to look to, <clears throat> and it might strengthen us, and it might enable us to live more godly, that it is a light under our path, that when the world is confronting us with all manner of complications and sinful desires and things that it would call, want us to look upon and desire, we ought to look to the light, look to the light of God's Word. It might help us to realize what is sin, what's not sin, and how that we ought to live for God as His saints. Called to be saints, he said, with all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, or call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. To everyone 
If they ever want to call upon him, we're all in this condition, that we are all are saints, and we are all sanctified by the grace of God, and that we are all, according to his good will and purpose, been bought with a price that we ought to live for him and not for self any longer. And it is a matter of praying and seeking God's leadership in your life. To know what His will for you is, and how you, uh, where, you know, where you, He'd have you to go, where He, how He'd have you to uh, approach people, even where He'd have you to work. Some of us in this present life, when we're saved, we probably work at places we ought not be working at. If you work in a place that serves alcohol and promotes wickedness. Then, as a Christian, you ought not be in that place. You ought not work there. You ought not patronize it. We ought to avoid such places, for it tarnishes our reputation. It does not show forth Christ's likeness to abide and to go unto such places. But to all that call upon the name of Jesus and our Lord. He is not just Savior, but He is our Lord also. And we have to submit ourselves unto Him. And once we're saved, it is a submitting unto Him. Submitting unto the will of God, submitting unto that which he's revealed unto us, submitting unto him in all things, that his will might govern our life, that in all of the aspects of our life, it might be a way in which it glorifies God according to his word and not the flesh, not this world. But unto all those, both theirs and all. And all those that call upon the Lord, Jews and Gentiles alike, and all of them under the church of Corinth, and the church at Ephesus, church of Jerusalem, under your church where you're a member at, each of those visible bodies of Christ, visible congregations, visible assemblies that have come together, that in that community, wherever you are, that they see a people who follow the Lord, who believe upon Jesus Christ, who declare that gospel in, their, in your daily walk of life. You're desiring and trying to show forth Christ. If you go to church on Sunday, and you dress up, and you put on your nice clothes, maybe your three-piece suits, maybe in fancy dresses, or maybe you just go in casual wear. And on that day, you profess Christ in godliness. And then on the next day on Monday you go out and you go to your place of work and go out and live your life. And in those, from that day to the end of the week, you live a totally different life. That is, you show forth worldliness and ungodliness. Then you're a hypocrite. And there are those that see that and they see it in some people. They say, well, they go, he goes to church over there, or she goes to church over there on Sunday. And then during the week, well, they live like the devil, they talk like the devil, or live like the world, talk like the world. People aren't fooled by that. They see your hypocrisy. Those that are lost and done around, uh, around about you, they see your hypocrisy. And if you're truly a saint of God, if you're truly sanctified by God and His will is working in your life, then this ought not be. You're trying to please two masters. And it can't be done. And God will not allow one that is truly His, one that is truly saved, to continue to abide like that. He will chasten you. He will rebuke you. And that Holy Spirit which dwells within each of us that are saved. It does prick our hearts and cause us to be reminded of what thus saith the Lord, that we ought to turn from our sinful ways, our sinful walk of life, and live for God. Verse 3, it says, Grace be unto you, and peace. Grace and peace. And these, as he said, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He speaks of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord, that grace is from God. We are saved by grace, not of ourselves, not of our works, 
not of anything we do, but we are fully saved by the grace of God, and that is saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone, not in any other thing, not in any other person, but solely in Jesus Christ are we saved by faith in Him. And that grace comes not just from the Lord, but from the Father and from the Holy Spirit. It is the whole God that is saving us from our lost, undone condition. And my friends, let me say unto this, there are those out there in the world today that only believe in a singular God, that is, they say that God's only one, and some on this, on one hand, there are those that uh, think like this and they deny Christ as God. And if you deny Christ, you have not salvation. It's not possible. Christ said, if you deny me, you have not even the Father. You know what that means? That means those Jewish people, even people of Israel in this very day and age, that as long as they refuse to receive Jesus and believe upon him, they can worship the Father all their life and they're still going to die and go to hell because they have not accepted the Savior, the only begotten Son of God, who has come and has died for them to redeem them from the sins. If there are chosen people unto God, they will see him. They will believe upon him. They'll trust him. But if they're not, for not all Israel is Israel. He's not well pleased with all of them. But only that remnant that is according to grace. That God had mercy upon both the Jews and the Gentiles alike. That grace of God which is toward us, which gives us peace in our hearts and our minds, a peace that the Bible says passeth all understanding. We can have all manner of trials and tribulations upon us and things happening around about us in our life and there can still be a peace within our hearts and our minds and know that our God has control of this matter. He has control of this situation. He has control of this present life. And it, uh, that uh, some that want to believe, well, God is just sitting back begging and pleading. He's not directly interfering. He's not uh, manip uh, say manipulating. It really is controlling, controlling the affairs and the events round about us. And if you believe God's is just like that, well, here's the storms and the tornadoes and the disasters and all this. It is surely is not God control and have the power of that. So was Satan's the prince and the power of the air. Yes, the Bible says that. But when he came before God and desired to play with Job, to toy with. To tear up his life as it were. He had to ask the permission of God to do it. They say to you that the saints of God, the children of God, the people that God hath declared, I will redeem them, I will save them. The Satan cannot touch a hair upon your head except God allowing. God is more powerful than Satan. He is God of all, even of Satan himself. And if Satan knows this, Satan desires to rise above it. But Satan is held back by the power of God and the power even of the Holy Spirit in this present life. The Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit holds back the workings and power of Satan. For Satan and his minions, his demons, his spirits that serve him, they've come forth and they would cause great miracles to happen if only the Holy Spirit would let them. My friends, be aware of this. The time is coming when the Holy Spirit will allow these things to be done. The Holy Spirit will allow miracles to be done by the demons in this world to deceive many, and it will. It will deceive the world. And they'll follow the false god. There is only one God, the scripture says. And because that, some say, well, there's only one God. God is one, so there's no trinity. They say, because that, there's no trinity. They don't understand the nature of God, and indeed the nature of God is hard to comprehend. How can God be one but yet three? How can we be one but yet three? Ask yourself that. Are you not three? The Bible says you are. The apostles prayed for us. Body soul, spirit. Three. Even as God is three, so is man, For because we have been made in the image of God. 
We've been made in his likeness. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And even as God is three, so is man. We have the body. We have the body of Christ. We have the soul. There's God the Father. There is the soul, as it were, the Lord. That aspect is the Lord, that soul which inhabited the body, which was prepared for him before the foundation of the world. And then we have our spirit. And there's the Holy Spirit. Three. Three and one. A great three and one. And even as God is three, so are we. Now, we spoke of those a minute ago there, of those who deny Christ, they deny him as God, they deny that he is part of the Godhead, that they deny him as, they say he's just a man, or he was just a man, just a prophet. And because of that, they deny him. And because of that, they have no hope. There's no mercy toward them as long as they deny Christ. Now, on the other hand, now where's, uh, there are other people in this world that they believe upon Jesus Christ. They believe in the God Jesus, but they believe yet that there is still only one God. They believe that God manifested himself as that singular, singular God in different ways throughout the ages. And in this present, and when uh, the God manifested himself in the flesh, and well, then you get to the trouble. Well, God is just that single entity in the flesh, in that body, which is called Jesus, and he's speaking of the Father. Well, let me ask you this. When Jesus was baptized, who was speaking from above? And what was up with that there dove that landed upon him? When the Word of God and all the gospel plainly declares that there is a Father, and that there is Jesus the Christ, and that there is that Comforter which He sent, the Holy Spirit. And we are also commanded to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I don't quite understand why some will hold to that doctrine. They'll deny the Trinity when the Trinity is plainly taught in the Scriptures, Old Testament, uh, Old Testament and New. And we ought to understand these things. And if you're part of an organization, an institution that denies the Trinity, then there's a lot of questions you need to ask yourself. Who, uh, uh, well, if there is no other God but that one in the body of Christ, and who's speaking from heaven? And what's up with that dove lighting upon him? And what's up with this? Uh, if he by himself is God, who is he referring to as Father then? Who's Father of God? Things you need to ask yourself. Are you have you not been deceived? Have you not believed a lie? You ought to understand that and this and it's called oneness. This doctrine is called oneness. They believe in one God. It's a misunderstanding of scriptures. Uh, you've got to compare scripture to scripture and study things out. Uh, can't just read a verse someone uh, rely just upon that, but you gotta study the whole counsel of God, and that's what we're striving to do here. We're going through now, verse by verse. Through Corinthians, uh, eventually I may go back and redo Romans. But uh, we'll get everything else done before we ever do that. But uh, God is three, and yet he's one. And that, that is just it's a hard thing for we as human beings to comprehend. The, that God is, in a, you know, he... he he sets these things before us, but yet it is something beyond our grasp, fully, full grasp and comprehension. Because God is above all things. He's outside space and time in a sense that space and time, uh, time has an effect on us. I start and I've got roughly 29 minutes to deliver this message unto you and speak to you what I can. But time has no effect upon God. He created time for us that it might be a method by which we can measure our actions in life and our uh, coming from youth to be to old age and old and all this, number our days. And how can we number our days except there be time? Time was created for us. We're in the beginning. God began time in the beginning. And then he created all things. God was there before there ever was this so-called thing of time of Seconds, minutes, hours. God 
who has given us peace above all understanding, helps us to just believe and have faith in these things, even if there be things that are beyond that which we can fully comprehend and grasp, such as the existence of God, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God helps us to believe upon Him even though we may not fully comprehend and understand these things. Verse 4, he says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. Paul thanking God. Thanking God for those that he had been able to meet in his life and those he'd been able to preach to and those especially that had believed upon the Jesus that he preached unto them, believed on Jesus Christ. And praise be unto God for those who God has allowed us to speak to. And for those who are believers, and for those who came unto us, those ministers of God in, the, in my life that I've known so far, and those that I know even today that are still yet alive and still yet involved in the ministry, praise be unto God, and I thank God for them. He's thanking God for those that believed, and there's only... Uh, one man that we've had the pleasure of baptizing. He was saved before uh, before I met him. But we had that pleasure to baptize one. And he may even see these videos. I don't know. But we pray for him. We pray for all those that we have pastored in the past. And we pray for all those that we now serve together at the church where we're at. Worship God together. And for all the saints of God. We too, likewise, like even Paul here, we lift them up before God, desiring that God would bless and strengthen each and every one of you and help you daily. That is said, for the grace of God which is given by given you by Jesus Christ. That grace of God. Grace of that triune God that in and through the aspect and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the grace of God that is given you, that in and through Christ you have that salvation. In and through Him, trusting in Him specifically, you have the grace of God, the salvation of the Lord, the faith that has been given in you to believe upon Him. And He says there's a Father. He says there's a Comforter who He has sent unto you, that Holy Spirit, which if you're saved, that Holy Spirit is a part of you. And it communes with your spirit that you can see and understand the things of God. Oh, my friends, what a blessing it is to know the Lord. What a blessing it is to have salvation and to not be still lost and undone in our sins. We've seen Jesus. We've seen him lifted up. And by that it means we've seen him as the one crucified for us, dying for us. Because of our sins, our sins, all of them were laid upon him there at the cross of, on the cross of Calvary. And he died. He, he died in our stead. He was buried in our place. And he arose for us, for each of us. He suffered and died and arose to redeem each and every one of us that were given unto him of God, that we might know him and free part of forgiveness of sin. And in the time and place where it has pleased God, he has saved us by his grace, and he has revealed him unto us. He's revealed his Son. And Jesus, his Son, reveals unto us the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because they're the same. They're... Uh, Father, Son, Spirit. It's all the same God. Three different sides of God, as you might think of it. And we're running out of time again, my friends. About a, maybe half a minute. But I pray God will bless this, and He might cause it to be a help unto some. That as we go through the Scriptures and teach the Scriptures unto you, that in these things you might see Jesus. And that you might put your full faith and trust in Jesus and not in the things of this life and the things of this world. May God bless each of you and God give you the strength to stand firm and be faithful unto the Lord. May God bless you until the next time.